All right, Spencer, let's talk about the book you wrote, The Invitation to Kinship, as you Got make it. available on spiritualsecretagent.com. I, I read it with utmost fascination. I thought, holy smokes, I do have stuff, something to learn here. I'm glad it was good for you. So at the end of book one, you know, um, I was raised by um, a woman, you know, my mom, uh, my dad, my parents divorced when I was three. I didn't see my dad that much. Uh, so I never really had a male, strong male model to imprint on. Uh, so I had to figure this out for myself. And at the end of the first book, I realized that if I want my partner to be attracted to me, if I want to shut down her hypergamy instinct, I have to be the best man. I've got to be so good that no matter who else comes along, she's just not interested. And if I can't do that, then I'm going to risk something else coming along. I don't have, now that doesn't mean I have to be better than everybody else. It just means I have to be the best that I can be. Another great guy can come along, but as long as I've got my stuff together, as long as I'm holding myself in a proper manner, I believe it won't be triggering her to find someone better. Right? So this was my uh, study on what it meant to be alpha. And at first I was looking at animals and I started looking at humans. <clears throat> now, where do we learn to be alpha? Well, right off the bat, just like genetics plays us for um, a genetic diversity rather than for uh, long-term marriages, it doesn't program most men to be alpha. It won't work. It only programs 5% of men to be alpha. And I was no exception. I you know, was not naturally an alpha guy. So I had to study it. I had to learn it. And what I'm going to share with your audience are the, the mannerisms, the language, the body language, the attitudes that uh, I think make for that kind of leadership in a man. Well, you know, I, I would say from my own memory bank, I remember the growing up years, the childhood, there was a constant struggle for establishing the pecking order in the group. Where I was growing up, there was only seven or eight boys in the group. And there was always somebody vying to be in the leadership position. Yeah. yeah. Oh. So there's two ways people lead, right, or, or rise. There's the king and the tyrant. So the book's called An Invitation to Kingship. And I define a king as an alpha man who's noble, who's taking care of the people around him, and a tyrant as an alpha male who's selfish and taking advantage of people. Now, a tyrant rises in the pecking order by suppressing and pushing other people down and insulting and intimidating. A king rises by declining any invitations to be submissive. So all a king has to do to rise to the top of the group is simply decline the up. When a tyrant comes along and tries to make them submit, and we'll talk about how this happens, they just simply decline it and then work for the good of the group. So if a man is strong and working to help other people and is doing it in a fearless manner, he'll naturally rise, right? So the first lesson in kingship, I believe, is called social play. And you see this in animals, they'll wrestle around on the ground. And there's a few rules to social play. One is they always take turns on who's on top. The second is there's no real injuries that are caused. And um, third is there's no great, it doesn't really escalate. Animals that get social play are successful at navigating, um, finding a mate and defending themselves. Animals that don't get social play uh, either receive violence, act violently towards others, and are unsuccessful at getting mates. So it's really important as men that when we raise our children, that we get down there and wrestle with them. But those rules are, don't just stay on top the whole time. Let the kid get on top. Let the kid win. And then you take, and then they, and alternate. Teach them how to alternate with force and play. And, you know, when we do um, workshops with people, I'll uh, pair two men off with each other of about the same body weight and tell them to shove each other alternatingly, hard enough to knock the other person off balance, right? And <clears throat> then one, you know, often the question will be, well, how hard do I push back? And I know this person got no social play. And I asked the group, how hard do you push back? And the rest of the group always says, 
exactly as hard as I pushed you. And that's the answer, right? So teaching people how to push and, you know, how to give a little force, and receive a little force. And in the workshop, I'll say, okay, one person push a little harder than they should. The other person goes falling back. Now there's two things that have to happen. First off, the person who got pushed too hard has to be provocable. They have to say, hey, that's not cool. And then the person who pushed too hard has to be like, my bad. And then you go back to it. So what we're learning is being provocable, I mean, saying, hey, that's not cool. And then owning up for it and apologizing. And that's the basis of social play, right? Yeah. I do another, oh, go ahead. Oh, <laughs> I'm just remembering this exact sort of situation in my, I don't know, ages four to 15. Mm, yeah. Now let's say. And, and getting pushed and having to make a decision. Oh, this, this person wants to go so hard that if I'm not strong enough, I'm going to get beat up. In fact, mm -hmm. when, when you, somebody who's, I don't know what, 20, 30% bigger, heavier, whatever, they will overpower you no matter what you try. Yeah, yeah, you gotta know how to defend yourself in this world. Yeah. Remember, Martin, it's not the size of the dog in the fight, it's the size of the fight in the dog. Some yeah. of the most brutal fight, street fights I've ever seen in the city, uh, the littler guy completely dominated the bigger guy that pushed him around. And so, you know, it doesn't take that much force to, to injure another human being. So um, let's say someone pushes too hard, right? If we don't push back, what have we taught that person? We've taught them that they can push us. So you have to decline that invitation, right? I'll, I'll give you an example, right? Let's say um, someone's shaking my hand and they, they're manhandling, they're crushing my hand, right? And maybe they're a bricklayer, they got really strong hands and they're crushing my hand. You know, and I'll do this in the, in the workshop. I'll be like, all right, what are my options? This guy is hurting me, right? I could just say nothing and, and he knows he's hurting me, I know he's hurting me and just wait for the pain to stop. At which point, you know, the pecking order has been established and I'm inviting more violence in the future from this guy. That doesn't work, right? I could give him a, a left hook and start fighting with him. Um, but now we're fighting and that's not what I wanted either. But if I take the, you know, go, go online and look up release from handshake, handshake grips. You know, you, I take, you take the flat of the hand and you slap them hard on their wrist and pull your hand out, right? Not the edge of the hand because that's going to hurt them and now you're fighting. Hit them with a the set and you pull your hand out. And they say, you know, something like to diffuse, like easy there, Hercules, or watch it there, you know, easy Brutus, you know? Just enough, you know, and the, and the goal is I have to hit this guy just hard enough. If I hit him too hard, it's a fight. If I don't hit him hard enough, then I'm inviting violence to myself later. And that's what social play teaches. It teaches how to get that fine line of just enough uh, reaction so that you minimize the amount of violence. Now, with that guy when you were 14, had you given him a good strong shove, he might have fought with you, or he might have been like, wow, Martin, you got some balls, all right. And then that would have been that, and you guys would have been best buds. You know, there's this, there's this, um, there's two kinds of interviews, right? There's the predatory interview, where someone's trying to determine if they, if you, if they can be criminal with you, like to rob or rape or whatever, right? Um, but then there's just the interview, like they're just testing to see where, where, the, where you are on the, on the pecking order. Mm -hmm. Now, if you were to push too hard, now he has to respond because he doesn't want to go lower. But if you hit just hard enough, the same amount of force, right? You're not saying that you're lesser and you're not saying you're greater. You're saying, hey, I'll accept equals with you, nothing else. Most people will go with that. So social play is the basis of being alpha. It's understanding how to respond with the right amount of force to the situation as it presents. Now, the, uh, there's a couple of other things associated with it. There's a, some body language and some verbal language. And uh, let's go through those. Yes. Yeah, okay, so the, the beta uh, is, um, wants to go back to the womb or wants to go back to suckle the breast. So you're gonna see uh, legs crossed, arms crossed, especially over the groin, uh, 
head down. They're trying to get back to fetal position or hands in pockets. They're trying to swaddle. They're saying, I really don't feel that comfortable in the world. I'd like to go back in the womb. So that's not a signal we want to be portraying. Uh, the, you know, the proper body language is chin up, shoulders back, legs apart, hands at your sides, just in a relaxed state. Yeah, the op they open the front, right? Yeah, yeah. So the language is another one. Now, this one took the longest to, uh, for me to kind of shift myself. Let's see if I can do this from memory, how many of them? All right, so the way in which alpha, toxic alphas, betas, and kings respond to situations is very different linguistically. Uh, a beta will ask for, ask permission, you know, a toxic alpha will just do it and, you know, that don't, won't care, will be kind of in a threatening, intimidating way. A king will be bold, but within boundaries. They're not going to wait for permission for things that they have to do. But they're not going to go beyond the boundaries and be disrespectful of others. It's that social play. It's that fine line, right? Um, a beta complains. A uh, toxic alpha uh, blames and a king takes responsibility. So getting the complaining and the blaming out of our vocabulary is a very powerful thing to deal with them as a man or a woman. Even though this is about being an alpha male, quote unquote, this stuff is just as applicable for a woman as for a man in many ways. One, there's a, you know, a woman should understand her masculine side, her, should understand her warrior side. If she has to go out into the world and compete uh, you know, maybe in a male dominated uh, industry, she's going to have to know the same rules by which everything plays out. Maybe she needs to um, raise boys to men and there's no strong man in the, around. She's going to have to pass these lessons on. Uh, she, and it also is helpful because it'll help her understand her mate better and mm, she'll understand the kind of things he needs to do to become stronger. So uh, never complain, uh, don't blame, uh, don't, ex don't defend yourself. If you're defending yourself, who is defending to whom? It's the beta defending to the alpha. Well, the alpha version of the uh, toxic alpha version of that is interrogating. You get people that love to interrogate and put people on a defensive. So don't interrogate, don't be toxic like that, but don't allow yourself to be interrogated. If you want to explain something, you can do it. But don't do it just because someone's riding you and demanding you to make an account for yourself. Having said that, that takes us to apologies. And there is a place for apologies. And I came up with two different kinds of apologies. I've got the hard apology and the soft apology. The hard apology is a tactical apology for a tactical mistake. You're doing something and you did it wrong. Nobody got their feelings hurt, but you say, my bad, I could have done that better, right? Maybe. You know, maybe it was something uh, like, imagine you're on a hunt, right? And you step on a twig and then uh, the sound alerts the prey and the prey goes off. You gotta be like, my bad, I totally screwed up guys, right? The moment you apologize, no one can rag on you anymore. If you don't apologize, they can keep ragging on you if you want it. So I like to apologize right up front because if someone then starts coming after me again for my mistake, I can be like, wait a minute. I apologize. We're done. Right. This is like owning the error and saying, I see my error, I acknowledge my error, and I'm sorry for it. Right. But how do we do it specifically, right? So the moment I heartfully, the moment I take responsibility for a screw up, if someone keeps riding on me, then I get to say, wait a minute, you're being aggressive. You're riding me now, and that's not cool. Right. The second kind of apology is a soft apology. That's where you hurt somebody's feelings. You say something inappropriate, you were insensitive, and that's where you're like, hey, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to hurt your feelings, right? So a tactical hard apology and a soft apology. A beta will do soft apologies for everything. A toxic alpha, if they apologize at all, will make a tactical apology for everything. Even if he makes somebody cry, he'll be like, oh, my bad. Like, no, you show a little emotion, show a little compassion. And for the beta, like, oh, I'm so sorry about that. I'm like, hey, dude. It was a tactical error. He didn't hurt my feelings. Just learn from it, right? Yeah. I, I have a friend who was being made fun of because he would apologize to the woman in the room if somebody swore or said something. Oh. 
like you would say, um, yeah. here, darling, I'm really sorry that you had to hear that. Right. So what he could have done is he could have said to them, the person who swore, like, hey, you know what? There's women and, and ladies in the room. Don't talk like that. That's not yeah. cool. Right. Correct. That's how, a king would, that's how a king would have responded. Right. Yeah. He would have fixed the situation and addressed the person who wasn't being impeccable. So. Yeah. Interesting. Those are really interesting examples. And I'm sure people, as they're listening to it here, will be able to come up with a lot of references in their own lives, how this, this plays out, right? It was quite a time before I was able to consistently follow these rules for myself. The most difficult one for me was self-deprecation. Um, if anyone ever said, hey, Spencer, that was fantastic. I'd always come back with, oh, no, it was not that great. And you know, it took me so long, Martin, just to say, thank you. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. that was it. <laughs> so, you know, just nobody's all alpha or all beta, right? We all have mannerisms a little bit of each. Some of us are a little bit of tyrant here, and a little passive there, and a little kingly here. So just observe yourself. And if any of these things are things that you recognize, well, Maybe it's something you might consider changing. Indeed. But the situation is that indeed there's only one boss in the office. There's only one alpha in any one place. And we need to recognize that if we, as you already said that example, but if there are too many alphas in any one grouping, you end up with conflict because they actually at the end have to fight it out because there's only one alpha. There's, that's the rule. So, we have to understand that we can be little alphas in our little teams, but we need to at the same time sort of recognize when we're beyond our reach. Well, here's how I would resolve that situation, Martin. Tyrants like to make everyone else suppress because they're threatened by other strong men. It threatens their hegemony, it threatens their leadership. A king wants as many other kings as possible. A king knows that the more kings there are in the world, the better the world is, right? I mean, men have failed women in our society. One out of three women are being raped. That's a failure for the men. Men are stronger than women. We can't ask the women necessarily to defend themselves against someone who's got 100 pounds of muscle on them. Every woman that got raped was somebody's brother, you know, uh, but someone's a sister or mother or daughter or somebody like that. It's a failure. Then, so I don't, I don't blame the women for being pissed off at the men that they're failing to lead. And what I would say is, there's room at the, there's room for as many kings as possible. The more, the better, right? Because a king wants the, as many kings as possible. He wants as many strong, noble, courageous men by his side because he knows the world is full of predators. So sure in the office, there's one alpha. That's our leadership role. But that doesn't mean you have to be submissive. That means you're supportive. You still hold your frame. You still have your self-respect. You still speak the proper way. You still respond the proper way. And if that boss is out of line, you still call them on it, right? It's just in that case, they're the one running point. If you're in a, if you're in a tribe and one guy's the best hunter, yeah, even though you might all be kingly, this guy's calling the shots. He's got the most experience. But then you get back to the tribe and someone's been injured and a different guy is the guy calling the shots about how we're going to you know, deal with the wound. And a different one is a guy who's figuring out what are we going to do to improve our, our weaponry. So it's okay to have lots of alpha men all working together, right? It's the tyrant that can't work with other powerful men. Kings, you can get a whole room full of kings. And each of them know at the time when it's for them to be in a position where they're listening to the person who has greater experience in that particular realm. Yeah. Yeah, you put it well. I mean, I was trying to uh, <laughs> say it, what you expressed, but I didn't have the uh, experience of the verbiage. It's I've been thinking about it longer, that's all. Yeah, that, which is great. I and mean, that's, that's a perfect example of it, right? Like, I'm just trying to say you're the king of your little domain. And you're explaining that indeed there are there are situations for which we individually are best at, and we should recognize that. And this opposite of self-deprecation is mm. stepping up and saying, 
let me do this. I know that I can do this, right? If a king goes to a foreign kingdom and he meets with another king, is he any less of a king himself? Mm, no, no, no. He's still a king. He will always be a king. Martin, you will always be a king in every situation. That's all. Mm -hmm. Right on. And our women want this of us. Not only do they need us to help keep the predators at bay, which we have failed to do, right? It's also what they're attracted to. And rightfully so, they want a strong man. So right. that's what book two is about, an invitation to kingship. Well, there's much more in that book than what we discovered, but oh, sure. my, it, <laughs> it's beautiful. Thank you again, Spencer, for sharing it with the world, especially in the selfless manner. Anybody can access it for free at spiritual spiritual secretagent.com. Do you feel like talking about the third book or have you had enough? So the third book is um it's, it's about it's a personal okay. development journey, right? Yeah, it's um so once I realized that I had to change myself so profoundly from this mostly beta male into something different, into the version of Kingly Spencer, then I thought, well, in what other ways do I need to change? And so the third book was going further in other manners in which a personality can be deconstructed and reconstructed. I can give you a little, uh, a little taste of a little bit of it. And it's called, um, the process is called Linguistic Upgrades. The book talks about five elements as a way to divide the world um, from, you, know, you could say, from physics. You have uh, air, fire, water, earth, and space. From physics, it could be motion, energy, spin, gravity, and ether. Uh, you know, we could see this playing out in lots of different ways. I'm mostly interested in how it plays out psychologically. So these elements play out as uh, fear, anger, uh, depression, materialism, and apathy. So one thing that you can do is when you are noticing your narrative, slightly shift it. Now it's important that the shift be slight. If the shift is too great, it's unauthentic. And this is where you get the people in the positivist movement, a lot of whom have committed suicide, unfortunately, because they're all serenity now, serenity now, but it's not real. They can't really get behind it. And that incongruity drives them mad. So what you can do is you want to be more serene, but you have to be honest with what your brain's capable of doing, right? All of our mental paths are myelinated pathways in our mind. And we can, over time, demyelinate one path and remyelinate another. But it's a slow process, like pruning a tree, except the tree is our neural net. So if you want to play around with this a little bit, uh, if you notice you're having fear language, say, wow, I'm afraid of, I'm scared of, upgrade it to, I'm mindful, I'm, I'm aware of, like, wow, I'm really scared of yada, yada, yada. Oh, I'm mindful, I'm aware that this could happen. It's a little, it's the same energy, it's still air element. It's just not fear, it's just milder. If you're angry with something, don't say, oh, I'm so furious that so-and-so did this. You can say, wow, that's really inconvenient that such and such happened. Yeah, annoy it's annoying. Yeah, right, if, if somebody cuts you off in traffic, uh, if some drunk driver just puts a huge scratch in your brand new car, and you're thinking to yourself, boy, that's inconvenient. How strong do you have to be to be able to reframe something that would piss everybody else off as inconvenience? When you reframe it in these milder forms, you are strengthening your character, uh, okay? If you are uh, feeling a need for something, that would be earth element. I need to have this, I wanna have this, I've gotta have that. Just say I prefer, right? I prefer to have this happen. That way, if you don't get it, it's not gonna drive you crazy, but you're honest with the fact that you have a preference. Water element, 
if you are experiencing sadness. I'm heartbroken that this happened. I'm so sad that happened. Yeah. You could upgrade it by saying, oh, yeah, I'm disappointed that this happened. Right. right. It's not a life ending. Right. Tragedy. It's a uh, sad, but. It, yeah, it's, it's disappointing. It's disappointing yeah. that, yeah, I got divorced. Yeah, that's disappointing. Right. <laughs> if, you can, if you have the strength of character to be able to reframe these things in honest, but slightly less intense or even much less intense forms, you're kind of gaining your power back from your own narrative. Yeah, and then, and then you can upgrade it to, boy, am I ever glad that I got to learn all of these lessons. Yeah, there's lots of ways that you can start working with the way the mind works. Um, and then you can start shutting the mind down entirely if you want. And there's tricks on using paradox to actually turn the mind off. Uh, mind off. Uh, best to read the book if you want to get into that deeply. Awesome. Indeed, there's plenty of room for personal growth. And uh, all of us who want to achieve more, be more, be more expansive, and be a better I don't know, servant of the creator, if you will, mm. has fulfilled our mission on the planet, then Spencer has done an awesome job of explaining these things and, and making logical structures that we can learn from. And I encourage everyone to, to take a serious look at this. And I'm just so grateful that, that you're willing to take time to, to share this. Thanks. Those are very kind words, Martin. Uh, so Spencer Feldman, you will find his products at life-enthusiast.com under the brand Remedy Link, and they are awesome products. And Spencer is a phenomenal health engineer who has developed things with great deal of understanding and talent. Take a look. Come to life-enthusiast.com. If you have questions about any of this, call me, one 866 543-3388. Thank you for listening and thank you, Spencer.